Hello everyone, in today's video we're going to be taking a look at the workflow I typically use uh, when setting my radios up in the real world. Keep in mind, uh, when you set up your radios in the real world, it's going to be a little different than the sim, but it's one of those things where I just kind of practice it both ways, just to stay on top of what's going on. So uh, let's go get started. First things first, though, we're inside of our lovely airplane here. Everything's looking pretty good. This is Mooney 20 Romeo. This is a lot fancier room Mooney than the one I fly, but hey, it's a Mooney, I don't care. <laughs> I like how they call it Mooney X. Anyway, oh, fun fact, by the way, all your power settings are in the back of this. Anyway, so what we're going to do today now is go ahead and get our radios all set up. We have a couple different radios to choose from for this particular aircraft, and uh, generally what I do is I do kind of all them all together. One of the nice things is in the real world, when somebody shuts down your plane, the radios are usually pretty close to what you want, but they always aren't, not necessarily. How's that for too many negatives? So the first thing we want to do is we want to figure out what we need to set our radios to before we start getting carried away here. So let me go ahead and grab up this handy dandy thing off the sky vector. This is Harvard Brainerd. Here's our handy dandy little sheet and it provides us with all sorts of critical information. And uh, one of the great things about this is it'll actually tell you everything you need to know. Uh, one thing we're going to need to know, of course, is going to be our ATIS. Uh, the next thing we're going to need to know is our ground frequency here. And of course, a very, very critical one here is going to be this Yankee departure and Yankee approach. And uh, we'll get to that in a second. So first things first, uh, let's go ahead and yeah, get the initial frequency set. So I like to always set my ground frequency as my active frequency. Uh, that just makes my life just a little bit simpler here. So as you remember from our little sheet that we saw just a few moments ago, I'll go ahead and pull that down so you all can see it. We're looking at 121.6. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and do 121.6. I'll do that up at the tippy top. I actually have external radios now, which is kind of a nice little toy. We're going to go ahead and swap that. And then I like to go ahead and put in my frequency for the actual tower down here. In this case, uh, we're going to be looking at 119.6, which is going to be the frequency that we need for that. That's the general flow. Now, if you're flying on an instrument flight plan, this uh, 121.6 might not necessarily be that particular frequency. It's going to be whatever your clearance delivery frequency is, which conveniently in Hartford happens to also be the ground frequency. Yay. Uh, the next thing people say is, uh, what about your uh, VOR frequencies? Well, this is going to be dependent on if you're using a VOR for your flight. In this case, uh, we're a little lucky because there's a VOR called Sandy Point. So if I actually go grab this all again, uh, one more moment. Moment, you'll actually see the Sandy Point VOR has got a frequency of 117.8. Uh, the one thing I like about setting a VOR is it's a great way to check your equipment to make sure it's working. So I actually come down here in my initial setup here and set that up right again. So we're looking at 117.80. Go ahead and swap that. I don't think we can detect it from here, which is exactly what I expected. Uh, one of the neat things in Hartford is we have a VOT, so we can actually test the VOR to make sure that it works. You're going to get that question wrong in the pilot test, by the way. No matter how many times you memorize it, you'll still get it backwards. Don't worry though, that's okay. So this is all set, I like that. And uh, then what I like to do is I like to set up my COM2 radio. Hopefully the aircraft you operate does have COM2. That's how I'm gonna make your life a little bit simpler. Um, you'll see 121.5 is already in the left side. Oh, that's a little silly. Uh, what we do instead, or what I normally do, I should say, is I actually set my COM2 radio to be whatever the expected ATIS is. So if you remember a minute ago, our ATIS here was a 126.45, I believe. I'm gonna confirm I'm not making that up here. 126.45, of course I know that. I've been here a million times. And I'm gonna go ahead and hit the swap button there so it pops. Whoops. <laughs> Be careful with your hand while you're moving controls, by the way. Boop. So now I've got my ATIS and my COM2. I've got my ground frequency. So in the real world, a lot of times what's going to happen is uh, people are going to be blah, 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 on the ground, and it's going to make you insane. So what I will actually do is I will come over here and go actually turn the volume down on that radio. So I'm going to press the receive COM2, and what will happen is in a moment, COM2 should start chirping to life, and it will start reading us the weather. And now you can see if I actually hit over here. Now, the way Flight Sim works is a little... It's, it's special <laughs> in that regard. But what it will do is it will start to read us the weather in a few moments. We can get um, all of our ATIS codes and things like that and everything we need. Uh, when we're all set with that, I always like to shut it off real quick uh, just to go ahead and make sure it doesn't continuously deafen us. So the next step in the workflow here, as far as a typical flight goes, like I said, doing a little bit of express or real world kind of uh, sort of features here. There's something I missed and it's killing me just a little bit. This button, by the way, don't forget to shut that off. I'll turn that on, I say, in the real world because what will happen is your autopilot won't work. And it'll make you uh, slightly insane because you can't figure out what that silly beeping is. And then you realize the autopilot's been flashing. Anyway, too many real world experiences with stuff like that. So what we do now, of course, is uh, we do our normal. We request our taxi. You know, you know, we get our flight following all set up and stuff like that. And then we'd find ourselves sitting at the end of the runway. You know, we'd 
just have finished up our little run up there and now we'd be sitting there going okay so now it's time to get ready for our last part now the interesting thing is when you get cleared with ground in the real world what's actually going to happen is they cleared you to the runway they'll call you if something comes up but basically when you get to the runway you're done with the ground so what i would do next as far as my workflow goes is again you want to listen in the real world there's three or four planes right here all doing the same thing i'm doing right now which is i just sit here kind of revving the engine up kind of a thing so what you would do now is you go ahead and swap to your tower frequency and now you want to put in your departure frequency now you're probably like what is the departure frequency well if you remember from before when we took a look at this you saw that a departure frequency and approach frequency is something called yankee approach uh, where i live yankee approach is actually north of us that's bradley they kind of own all the airspace above us but this is going to be the frequency that we're going to use that 127.8 so what i'm going to do now is i'm going to go ahead and dial in my 127.8 right into the top radio because that's going to be the next people i want to communicate with and you can see 127.8 has been selected my ground free my tower frequency is ready to go so the next thing i would do is i'd double check this so my atus is looking pretty good notice i got 121.5 one oh, it's kind of as my backup so i go ahead and release the parking brake and uh, you know we come uh, sneak up to the line by the way in the real world expect a lot of hand signals between you and all the traffic here it's <laughs> it's ridiculous so we'd come up here of course to the line i'll kind of pause in a few moments i obviously do not cross that magical line we're professionals though we'd actually tip a plane into the wind which i didn't do that's naughty you know we do one of these things uh, we get on the tower up uh, rain tower uh, Mooney uh, 64 Red is uh, holding short of 2 on Alpha. Request a departure to the southeast. They go ahead and call us back. They read back our frequencies and everything like that. We go ahead and uh, kind of get rolling. You know, say clear to take off 2, and it's say clear to, to a right turn approved kind of thing. Whatever they're actually asking us to do on that particular day. Of course, you know, depending on the day kind of a thing, it's going to depend. We're a Mooney, so we actually would fly in a little bit of takeoff flaps there. Uh, if you don't use the takeoff flaps, by the way, uh, for those of you who are used to simple planes, it is an interesting experience. It's not to say the aircraft doesn't take off. It's just to say with a Mooney, it doesn't take off flat. <laughs> it's very odd. It's sort of like tearing the plane off the ground if you don't use the takeoff flaps. It will do it, especially if you're lightweight, but if you have anybody in the back seat, it's it's just kind of dangerous. Like it's just sort of one of those things. All right, there's about 65. Lift that nose up. Got plenty of runway underneath us, so I'm not going to touch that handles. Now, one of the other fun things with the Mooney in the real world is uh, when you bring up your flaps and your gear, the nose pitches up. And, uh, it's just kind of one of those things that I'm not used to. I'm always used to these things getting really heavy uh, when you're in power here. So that's 80. I'm out of runway. Go ahead and I'll bring that up. Bring that up. Now, in the real world, the nose would come up. Now, if you look carefully, nothing happens. Ah! <laughs> it's just... Little, 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 little things. All right, so we'd climb up, um, just like in the real world, we'd uh, maintain whatever they told us to do. A lot of times, at least in Hartford, they tell us to hang on to runway heading for a bit, and then they'd say something like, uh, right turn approved. And what would happen is we'd go ahead and take a right turn like this. Uh, we'd almost get run over by about six training airplanes. <laughs> it happens every day. And there's always that one guy in an air coupe who's like, do you even have a working transponder? How are you able to? Anyway, I rant. So we'd go up here, and what they would do is they'd say, go ahead and contact departure. That could be all that they would say. Now, the big thing here is, remember how we got the departure frequency locked in there at that 127.8? Watch this. Boop. Stand by. Uh, Bradley Approach, uh, Mooney uh, Red 64 is at uh, 1,000 feet, climbing 4,500. And that's it. And then they go ahead and give us the radar contact and we'd be on our way. Uh, once we're nice and clear of the actual flight area, of course, uh, this would be the time to go ahead and switch our frequencies again. What I like to do in the real world is actually to flip over to 121.5. Uh, that's the universal distress frequency. And I actually go switch this over to COM2 so that I can listen in case anybody's in distress. A word from the wise, by the way, uh, what happens is uh, people's ELTs go off at random intervals. And when that occurs, of course, um, you're going to hear beep, 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 beep. Actually, it's wee, 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 wee. And of course, we always joke that's the sky police. So be ready to have to turn that on or off because that'll get kind of distracting. So usually at this point, the only other radio changes I'm going to get is when I go down, down south, and they're going to tell me to get ready for New York approach and everything like that. But just how will we figure out that frequency in advance? This is where things start to get a little bit more interesting. Uh, one of the problems we have is the altitude we're flying at has a big impact on what frequency we're actually going to be communicating with. Uh, one of the things you'll notice, for example, is that we have a lot of these little airports kind of along the way on our journey. Uh, we're currently at 4,500 feet. So if uh, we were in a situation where we were at, let's say, 2,400 feet, you would see that we'd actually be choo-chooing right through this airspace here that Groton owns. So one of the things that may occur is you'll actually get a very, very late call from a basically Yankee approach, giving you 
you a quick little reminder. So depending on the kind of uh, traffic frequency, it's not unusual for the person controlling this region to actually give you several potential different frequencies. But we have a couple things we can go off of. Uh, one thing we know, if we have to talk to Groton, if they hand us off to Groton Tower, uh, the only time, by the way, I've ever been handed off to a tower is uh, being down here in New York City. They actually gave me JFK Tower in order to get through their airspace. It was just easier for them. But uh, one of the things we have is we can actually take a look at that frequency itself. You know, we can pop up this website real quick. We can go on here. We can see that their tower, of course, is going to be 125.6, assuming that. But we also have an interesting thing here. We know what the Providence approach and departure frequencies are for 125.75, and that is going to be controlling the vicinity of this particular airport. So if we pop back over here, um, again, this is going to be dependent on altitude and things. And yes, I am traveling at the wrong altitude for this direction. You got me. So if we were to come over here and actually adjust that, you know, we can actually put that in right away. You know, we can put it that 12575, expecting to have to be able to communicate them. Again, it's going to be completely dependent on what our altitude is. We could actually be in New York kind of a thing. But we have a pretty good idea we're going to be talking from Bradley over to Providence Approach. Now, as we're kind of on our way here, this is a really fast plane, by the way. Um, we're going to be there pretty soon. Uh, like I can see, it's a 15-minute flight for us, which is nothing, given how irritating it is in the real world. We Now we want to go ahead and uh, swing back to our COM2 radio. Um, this is the time, of course, when we need to start thinking about our landing and our approaches and items like that. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go over to Black Island and figure out exactly what all the critical frequencies are going to be. Now, one of the mistakes that I always make, and again, I always fly with flight following because it's a lot safer to do that, is I will do something really, really silly, like try to, uh, you know, kind of guess uh, when they're going to need to do a specific moment or a specific turn or something like that. That can be kind of sketchy. But you can see here over at Black Island State that it's an uncontrolled airport. So we have a lot of tricky things. Remember that 125.75? Surprise! There it is again. Also notice our clearance delivery frequency is completely different. That doesn't really affect us though. We know we need to be on a frequency of one, two, three. We also notice that our AWOS or ATOS is our ATOS, that's a new one, I invented one, is one three four point seven seven five. So let's go ahead and get those all programmed in. Oh, we said one three four seven seven five, which is gonna be the first one. Uh, keep in mind ATIS, you can't pick up at maximum range. So you have to get a lot closer to be actually able to hear the darn thing. You know, one of the tricks of course we use in the real world is you can pull this little handle out right here, pull the squawk off, and since as you can get lucky and just start to hear it off at the distance, but usually doesn't happen. Uh, once that's all been said, of course, I like, like I said, I like to leave that one in here. Uh, we're going to be talking with those guys. Let's assume they, they told us to transfer over. Uh, let's say we're now talking to Providence Approach. Now would be the time to go ahead and uh, dial in your one, two, three here, which, like I said, incredibly convenient frequency here. Easy to remember. Aha! I love it when it does that. One, two, three point zero zero. So now we're ready as far as that goes. Now our distance to our destination is about 40 nautical miles. Two. Oh, oh sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. I mean, um, yeah, our destination is about 30 nautical miles. So now this is a good time to go ahead and check on that weather there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and I'll go right on down here. I'm going to go ahead and press the COM2. And what you'll actually start to hear, which you probably heard a while ago, is you're actually going to be hearing all the critical weather information from that particular airport that we're going to be arriving in. I'll be listening to that for a little bit while and I'll kind of be like, all right, that works for me. And then, of course, uh, when we're done with it, we can always pop that button real quick. Now, one of the nice things is the visibility today is perfect. <laughs> it doesn't look like this in the real world. But we can already start to see Block Island. Now, one of those general rules of thumbs I've learned from uh, flying for a little while now is that you don't stop talking to people until you're pretty much ready to land. Uh, one of the things I have in the real world is I have a tablet, and it talks to the ATIS, which actually, I'm not the ATIS, it talks to the ADSB, which allows me to see other traffic. So I already can kind of know what's going on here, even though there'll be somebody over here in a Bonanza, there'll be someone up here in a Twin Beach, and they'd all be kind of doing one of these at the same time. You'd have a pretty good heads up for that. But one of the things that you can do is you can call the Cancel Flight File. Following. The moment they call that cancel flight follow, of course, now you're on your own. So again, I'd like to try to cover the coast first. There we go. That's a little better. So remember that airspace that I was warning you about? Uh, we just passed basically right by that airport a moment ago. So we have to kind of keep that in the back of our heads like I've been saying. So now we've crossed into that point. It would be time to go ahead and switch over to the local frequency. Uh, one thing that I would recommend doing too is when you are getting ready for the last couple minutes to actually put it on the land, make sure you just double check that ATIS one more time to make sure that uh, something didn't change or there's an emergency on the runway. Just take that quick little listen to it. Just double check it. And when you're happy with it, you're kind of ready to rock and you can go ahead and shut that sucker off. So at this point, it's just a matter of getting the plane all the way down on the ground. Yeah, we're a little high, but I think it'll be all right here. So the cool thing here is, uh, welcome back to Block Island. Uh, this is, I swear, I've never landed at this airfield without a crosswind and without the wind speed being at least 10 or 15 knots. And uh, we are high and we are very, very, very fast here. So I'm actually going to slip the plane a little bit. 
Yay for flights and physics. Ah, now I'm all set. <laughs> Just kind of one of those things. All right, so let's go ahead and deal with that pesky wind there. Oh, it's not too bad. I mean, it, it, it's noticeable, but it's not game over wind here. All right, it's pretty good. We're just gonna, we're at Mooney. We can just kind of coast in for the last couple feet. Speed breaks out over the ground. And a little bit of left wing, a little bit of left wing. There it is right there. Nice. So now we've arrived at our destination. Everything is looking pretty good. Well, again, unfortunately, they closed a Bethany's here, which was this nice little airport diner that they used to have. So it's like, ah, bummer, we can't stop. So now at certain airports in the real world, what will happen is you'll actually have a local frequency. So even though we all have our little kind of a unicom that we'd be communicating on this whole time, they would actually have a giant sign on the wall that would say contact 124.75 or something for ground services. And that would give you the ability to go ahead and dial in that number. For our particular destination here, we don't have any of that, so we don't have to worry about that. At this point, it's a matter of uh, landing the plane, securing the plane. Wow, that building's not bigger than it is in the real world. Uh, kind of getting everything uh, ready to rock as far as that goes. But as you can see, it's a relatively straightforward process, and a lot of that frequency business all comes down to your pre-planning and having good access to information. Now, if you have some uh, certain types of EFBs, it's really easy because it's all going to be right in front of you. Otherwise, the good folks over at FlightSim, believe it or not, do a pretty decent job of kind of hooking us up here. Now, I love how it says, tune traffic um yo <laughs> other than that enjoy